So this is, a, I've called it, I Have Set You Over Nations. Anybody recognize what book that comes from? It's, it's Jeremiah. It's something God spoke to Jeremiah. And uh, you might, I've set you over nations. What? You might think, what does that have to do with you? Or what does that have to do with me, right? Turns out it, it does. It has, it has a lot to do with us. And so I'll, I'll share that with you as we go. But this, uh, this is a story. It starts in Jeremiah chapter 1, and I'm just going to read verse 1 through 12 today. Uh, maybe throw in a couple of other verses, but uh, essentially this is the story of Jeremiah's first encounter with God. Uh, he's a young man in Israel, and uh, he has his first experience with God. Here's God's voice, and God calls him into the ministry to become a prophet. And so there's a lot of cool things in there. But really, one of the things I'm going after today, just to be upfront, is a call to prayer. Right? Because, you know, the church, the church is called to prayer, and that's not something that's just a religious exercise. It's not something that really doesn't mean anything or change anything. It's not just something we have to do. Right? A call to prayer is it's militant, and it's how God works. Amen. God works through prayer in a big way, and, and uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. But I believe that right now, especially, God is just, at least he's speaking to me about a call to prayer more than ever before, right? And it's not because, oh, everything's terrible, and, you know, oh, what are we going to do? You know, all we can do now is pray. I know that. I'm not talking about that kind of, you know, thinking. Uh, I believe God is doing amazing things. He's got amazing plans. And whenever God wants to do something great, he moves through prayer, he raises people up through prayer, and that's how he moves, and that's what he does, right? And so God has set up this, this system so that everything he does, he does through his people. And he doesn't, you know, he doesn't move independently of us, really. He moves in partnership with us. Could he have done it differently? I suppose, sure. But from creation, God set this up by his choice where everything he does, he does in partnership with his people, he does in right, cooperation, and he, uh, when he wants to do something, he has people pray, and he speaks to hearts, right? And, and he brings people into that prayer partnership. That's how he's chosen to work. So, you know, the simple, simple fact is when we do pray, uh, God does stuff. He changes things, right? When we don't pray, stuff doesn't change, and sometimes stuff gets worse because there's enemy influence that's going to keep working, right, if we don't. Uh, you know, participate in prayer. And, and a lot of Christians really get a very wrong idea, which is just that, oh, you know, God's just going to do what God's going to do. You know, I'm just along for the ride. Oh, no, that's just, that's not biblically correct in any way at all. Uh, God, when God works in the earth, he finds people that he wants to partner with and work through in prayer. So I'll show you that. And it turns out that's actually, at least part of that's in Jeremiah chapter one, which I think is very cool. I want to read through the passage one through 12, and then we'll go back and go verse by verse. So the words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests who were in Anathoth, in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the carrying away of Jerusalem captive in the fifth month. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Then said I, Ah, oh Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am a youth, for you shall go to all to whom I send you. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down, to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. There's, that. There's the title, by the way. I have set you over nations. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? And I said, I see a branch of an almond tree. And then the Lord said to me, you have seen well, for I am ready to perform my word. All right, so let's jump back to verse 1 and just kind of comb through this a little bit. Because this is, this is an amazing encounter. This is where Jeremiah gets called to be all right, a minister of God, a prophet of God. And that's an amazing thing. Uh, but it, it's all going to relate to us as well. 
So it begins with the words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests who were in Anathoth. And so the, uh, the, the first point I, I see here that just speaks to me is the fact that God is a God of honor. Right? And Jeremiah came from a family of priests, in other words, a family that was already serving God. They were already in, in the Lord's ministry and apparently loved God and apparently served God. And God is a God of honor. So when people serve him and love him, he tends to visit the second and third generation and he keeps calling people right to himself into his service that way. His hand stays upon that family, which I think is very, very cool. That's God's way of honoring. Right? Um, you know, can he, can he call people outside of that chain? Of course he can. You know, the famous story of Abraham, Abraham came from a family of idol worshipers and God said, come and follow me, right, into your destiny. Uh, and so God can still do that. He still does do that. He did that with me, called me out of, right? Uh, and, and, and then, uh, but once that, once that kind of kicks in and, and you have a generation that serves God, then God wants to keep his hand on that family and start calling more people out of that family, which is very cool, right? I love that. So how many have heard, you know, somebody say they came from a, they were like a third generation pastor or a fourth generation pastor. Have you ever heard? Yeah, that, that happens. Very cool. That's God at work there. So Jeremiah comes from a family already in, in the ministry of God. Go ahead. To whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the 13th year of his reign. So part of this is just documenting historically, you know, when he served, which is valuable. Uh, but he says, the word of the Lord came, right? And that's his, uh, I presume from reading this, that's his first experience with the word of God. That, you know, he's, he's believed in the Lord, he's maybe loved the Lord, you know. But this is the moment when he hears God's voice for the first time. Boom. <laughs> and that's a, that's a game changer always. Go ahead. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, till the end of the 11th year of Zedekiah, son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the carrying away of Jerusalem captive in the fifth month. This one strikes me, too, because uh, we know from reading the story that in the context that Jeremiah is prophesying to Israel in a time when, you know, Israel had been going into idolatry again and again and again, right? Worshiping other gods and idolatry and sin and, and you know, and God had been warning them through multiple prophets for years, you know, and, and the specific warning was that if they continued in that direction, that there was going to be an invasion of Babylon, the kingdom of Babylon, coming into Israel, conquering Israel and carrying people off captive for 70 years was the prophecy, right? And then he would bring them back. It was like a 70-year-long spanking, you know? <laughs> it's kind of what, what that was, you know? And that, and that prophecy kept coming. And Jeremiah, this is the setting. He's prophesying to Israel for decades, saying there's a judgment coming, right? Turn back to God. Turn back to God. You can avoid this, right? But the, the, the thing about it is he says that he prophesied until Israel was carried away captive. Jerusalem was carried away captive. So there's an interesting question. Was his ministry successful? <laughs> in, in one definition, no. In one other definition, yes. And here's, here's the interesting thing. God had even told him in advance, they're not going to listen to you. But Jeremiah, do it anyway. Prophesy anyway, but they're not going to listen to you. Right? They're just they're going to go that way. But I still need you to witness. I still need you to speak out, right? And so uh, Jeremiah was obedient in in a sense where he absolutely knew that that you know basically they're not going to turn and listen to him. Um, but how many have been blessed by reading the book of Jeremiah ever, right? Or hearing and teaching from the book of Jeremiah? Amazing, yeah. What he wrote and prophesied uh, has has become part of the Bible and has lasted. 2,700 years or whatever that is, you know, 26, 2,700 years, and uh, blesses us to this day. And Jeremiah also, like all the other Old Testament prophets, he prophesied about the Messiah. All of the Old Testament prophets, somehow, some way, prophesied about Jesus. They all predicted a Savior. They all predicted a Messiah. And that's one of the ways that we know that God, that they were a true prophet of God, and that their prophetic book belongs in the Bible, because they always prophesied about a Messiah to come. Amazing, right? So he, he does that. And some of the people of Israel listened to him. Some did, right? And some, some turned their hearts and some responded to his message, but the leadership and the majority did not. So in one sense, he was obedient. He was successful simply because he was obedient. And he reached some people, and his words bless us to this day. But in another sense, his, his actual ministry, and he kind of knew going in, was not a success in terms of turning Israel, but he was faithful anyway. 
Wow, what does that take, right? <laughs> Whew. Go ahead. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, All right, and I just got to stop here because this just speaks to me so much. And, and here's what it has to do with us because this, this, is, this is for us. Uh, the word of the Lord came to him presumably the first time, and that's always a game changer. How many know the first time when you experienced either God's presence, an encounter with God, or God spoke to you in some way, right? And it just, nothing's the same after that. Like, what, that, was, that was a mark, right? That was a changing point. It's a turning point in some way, right? And I remember that in my own life, you know, and I've shared this with um, many of you numerous times. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the short version for me here is that, you know, I was, I was drinking as an alcoholic from the time I was 15, and I walked into an AA meeting when I'm 21, turning 21, and, uh, you know, looking to get sober, and, and I did not know God and didn't necessarily believe in God. And, and, and AA says, you know, one of the steps of AA is give your life over to the, you know, care of God. And, and I'm, I'm hearing this, and I'm going, I don't even know if I believe in God, right? I don't know if God's real. And, and, and I did one thing right. One thing right, which is uh, after the meeting every night, I, I would go home and I would pr kind of pray, or that's what you call it, right? I was talking out loud, hoping somebody's listening, and I'm going, God, are you there? God, are you real? God, are you listening? You know, can I know you? I don't want a religion. I don't want church. I don't want doctrine. I don't want theology. I want to know you. Are you real? Are you there? And that's what I was doing night after night for three weeks. And for the first three weeks, I heard crickets. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> nothing, you know, and part of me is going, that confirms that he's not real, you know, and then part of me was like, I'm not quitting, I don't know why, but I'm not quitting, right, and I, and, and well, after three weeks, I went to the AA meeting again that night, and they were talking about trusting God, you know, and, and, uh, and I came back, and I prayed, and I said, God, I don't, I'm supposed to trust you, I don't even know if you're real, and even if you are real, you've never done anything for me that I know of, and I don't know how I could possibly just trust you, right, I was just being honest, but I was talking out loud to God, hoping somebody was listening. And, and that's the moment when it happened. And that's the moment God's presence came. And I was in my bedroom. His presence came. You know, the presence of God surrounded me like a cl cloud of just love and glory and power and majesty. And boom, the presence of God was right there. And instantly I went, oh, that's a game changer. You're real. <laughs> you know. And then he spoke to me just immediately. He spoke to me. Nobody else in the room would have heard it, but I heard it. And he said, give me your life for 24 hours. And if you don't like it, you can change your mind. <laughs> I'm like, ah! <laughs> right? And that was the beginning of my walk with God, you know, and that led me to Jesus and salvation and ultimately ministry. But God said, give me your life for 24 hours. If you don't like it, you can change your mind. You know, it wasn't like kneel before me and, you know, it, you know, it was just, he spoke to me that way. It just blew me away, completely, total game changer. First time I heard the voice of God, and, and after that happens, guess what? Nothing's the same. Anybody can use their argument against God, you know, and I'm like, I'm sorry you can't convince me because <laughs> I've already met him, <laughs> right? There's just nothing you can say, right? And that's, uh, that's the game changer for all of us, an encounter with God, his presence, his voice, something that you know, that marks that change, that difference. And, and I was not, you know, instantly all cleaned up and wonderful. I was a mess for, a horrible mess for at least a year and a half after that still, right? But everything changed in that moment, right? And, and I knew the direction I was going. So what's my point here is I know that um, in the body of Christ in American Western Christianity, people are not really taught to go after the voice of God. You know, they're taught to go to church and pray before you eat dinner and throw something in the offering and be a good person, right? Uh, and, and, and I really believe that there's an enormous value in pursuing God to where you have his voice in your life, right? You have his communication, his presence in a very real and personal way with you. And if we don't have that, we really just have religion, you know? I mean, you may be genuinely saved and going to heaven, and that's wonderful, but, but this is supposed to be a personal thing, right? And so I believe that, you know, if you don't experience that uh, at all or enough, pursue God, you know? Pursue God like I did and just say, God, I want to know you. God, I want you to teach me, lead me, speak to me. 
take control of my life, right? I want to, I want to know you, right? Reveal yourself to me. Speak to me. Pursue a, until, and ask him questions until communication begins. Because in my experience, it does. He's pretty faithful to that. And it's not just because I'm called to ministry. I believe that, you know, Jesus said, all my sheep know my voice, right? We can all have that. And it's a total game changer. And in the days we're coming into, you know, where there's more craziness and more pressure in the world, and it's going to increase out there, right? We need to, to be people that know God's presence and God's voice. We do, right? Absolutely. And it doesn't mean he has to speak to you every day or, you know, every week even. But, but, the, but that has to be in place. At some level, that has to be in place, right? And so total game changer that we need to uh, absolutely pursue. Uh, so go ahead. And then, so God said to him, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Whoa, that's pretty powerful too. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Does this again speak to the value of an unborn baby? Oh, absolutely it does. It certainly does. I believe a baby in the womb has as much value as a baby out of the womb. Right? And God speaks to this and says, I was the one forming you in the womb. That was me. I was involved. I was present. Right? And that's, that's not just Jeremiah. That's all of us. Right? And, and he says, before you were born, I set you apart. I sanctified you. Or I ordained you a prophet to the nations. You know, and that's, and that's you too. You don't have to be called to be a, you know, a prophet like Jeremiah and write a book of the Bible. But God has a plan for you. God has ways that he wants to gift you and use you and lead you and, and have you influence others, right, and be a blessing to this world. God has plans for you, and he has those plans from the time you're in the womb, right? We want to honor that. We want to value and recognize that. And so he said, I ordained you, right, a prophet to the nations. Mm. Yep, go ahead. Verse 6, then said I, ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. And so this is how we know Jeremiah is, is obviously a young man at the, is this first experience, and he's got, you know, the insecurity of a young man, like, wow, you're calling me? I don't know. Call somebody else, right? And this is, a common, this is a common thing, you know, throughout the Bible. God called Moses, and Moses said, oh, pick somebody else, right? And then God called Gideon, and Gideon said, not me, pick somebody else, right? And that, that happens a lot over and over, you know, so... Uh, this happens here with Jeremiah too, and, and, but God wasn't having it. Verse 7, But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am a youth, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. So this is God saying, uh, no, you know, I'm calling you. I'm, don't disqualify yourself. I'm calling you. And, you know, and our response usually is, well, I can't do it. And God's answer, I'm paraphrasing for him, but God's answer is, you're right, you can't do it, but I'll be with you. And that changes everything. Right? You lean on me, you walk with me, I'll be with you. I don't need you to be able to do it on your own. I need you to respond and walk with me. And then we'll do it. We'll do this together. I'll do this with you and through you. And so all we really need is, you know, a yes, a big yes. So whatever our whatever we, you know, want to disqualify ourselves with. But he says, you shall go to all who, to whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Uh, that's all of our assignment, isn't it? <laughs> really, you don't have to be a biblical prophet. Just God says, I've got, I've got an area of influence for you. I've got people that I'm going to send you to, you know. And it's not just the, the mega preachers. It's every person in the body of Christ. If we all influence the people around us, the kingdom of God grows in a beautiful way, right? And that, yeah, God wants to use every one of us. And, and so he's, he's, he wants us to speak to people around us out of our overflow of our relationship with him. Right? So this, this, this applies to all of us. Go ahead. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Oh, this gets interesting now. So... Uh, later on is where God's going to tell him, you know, they're not going to listen to you. They're really not going to, you know, pay attention. But he said, don't be afraid of them, right? Don't be afraid of them. Um, and if, if, if you're going to, if you're going to serve God, one of the things we just, you have to get over is fear of man. Amen. And, and I know what that is because when God called me into the ministry, I had lots of fear of man. I had lots of insecurity and I had lots of fear of rejection and I had lots of, you know, introverted thinking, and, you know, I'll just hide in the corner, and that was, you know, that was kind of me, uh, and uh, God's like, no, I want you to, 
Talk to people. Don't be afraid of their faces. You know, don't be afraid of rejection. Don't be afraid of what they think of you. Don't be afraid of even people who would actually reject you, actually mock you, actually criticize you. Right? Does that happen? Yeah. <laughs> right? And, and so if, if you're going to serve God at any level, God says, get over the fear of man. It doesn't mean be a jerk. It doesn't mean I don't care what anybody thinks. That's not what we're talking about. We are actually people who are moved with love and compassion, aren't we? We're, we're, we're seeing people as in need of Jesus, no matter how messed up they are, and we want to share Jesus with them. So we're not talking about becoming a big jerk, you know. Uh, but we do have to get over the fear of man. We just do, because <laughs> that's idolatry. It really is. It's a form of idolatry. God says, get over it, get over it. And in this, in this particular case, it was harder for him than it is for us, because he was assigned as a prophet to Israel during a time of idolatry, and they didn't want to hear it at all, right? Yeah, and, and so, you know, God's had prophets throughout history, Old Covenant, New Covenant. God's still got prophets, amen? That's apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. It's still in the body of Christ. But there's a difference between an Old Covenant prophet and a New Covenant prophet. And the difference is pretty big, actually, even though they're both prophets, legitimately. But an Old Covenant prophet represents the Old Covenant, because that's what they were living under, that's what they were part of, and that's, um, they represented God, and God was in an old, the Old Covenant with Israel, the Mosaic Covenant with Israel. So, of course, the prophet's going to represent that covenant, and that covenant had built into it uh, all these commandments and rules and, you know, everything, and also built into it was judgments and punishments if they went after other gods, or if they were in continual sin, and unrepentant sin in some way, right? There was judgments and punishments built into the covenant. And so the old covenant prophets, by, by the very nature of that, were often thundering out judgment against Israel, right? Because they were enforcing the old covenant. <laughs> That's the nature of the beast, right? Uh, what, what does a new covenant prophet do? Well, a new covenant prophet now represents Jesus and represents the new covenant, Amen? And it's a different thing, isn't it? So a new covenant prophet represents the gospel, represents the finished work of Christ, and represents the great commission, which Jesus said, go into the world and preach the gospel, make disciples, right? And so a new covenant prophet is part of that covenant, represents that covenant, represents God in that covenant. And that's what they're going to advance. Is their message going to be different? Yes, actually, it is. Uh, and so, you know, I, I've known people over the years, you've probably all known people that, you know, kind of get the idea that, you know, God's called them to be a prophet, and then they model themselves after an old covenant prophet. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And they go around thundering judgment against everybody, and God's judging this, and God's judging you, and God's judging that, and, you know, I'm the messenger. Oh, good for you. Um, and uh, my, my response to that is, dude, you're about 2,000 years too late. You're in the wrong covenant. <laughs> if you're if you're genuinely called to be a prophet of God now, fine. But you got you're you're called to be a prophet of God under the new covenant and represent the new covenant. Amen. And God's really right now not just going around thundering judgment on everybody. I mean, you know, you might want him to, and you might feel like it's a good idea. You know, <laughs> once we're on the right side of things, you know, you kind of go, "Come on, God, get him." You know, but um, <laughs> that would have been us there not too long ago, right? <laughs> so. The deal is the new covenant is by nature about bringing the gospel, bringing reconciliation, you know, bringing, advancing the kingdom and bringing people into their callings and prophesying people's giftings and callings and their assignments. And, you know, it's a different thing, right? It's a very different thing. Uh, and so we're, we're just sharing the good news of Christ. Uh, do we still struggle with fear even at that level? Well, yeah, even at that level, we can struggle with our own fears, our own insecurities, our own fear of rejection. God says, no, get over it. Don't be afraid of their faces, right? You're an ambassador of Christ. You're a, you're a messenger of heaven. Don't be, don't be afraid of people. Love them, but don't be afraid of them. <laughs> Amen? But Jeremiah, he was facing people that literally did not want to hear what he had to say at all. And some of them wanted to kill him. <laughs> so, very interesting stuff. Is, is there still a message of repentance in the new covenant? Sure there is, absolutely. When the church is off track, you know, and I believe that one of the things that God wants us right now as the American church to do is really shake off complacency and shake off entitlement. Amen? And... Uh, an entitlement attitude, I think, is pretty heavy on the church. And wake up and shake it off and pray, right? For starters, pray, 
right? Because uh, God is, is doing great stuff in America, and he's doing great stuff in the world, and there's a great outpouring coming, but he wants us to pray, right? And that, the, the kind of, you know, attitude in Christians, well, God's just going to do what God's going to do. Uh-uh. You know, that's, that's only true in, like, the second coming. He's going to come. He's going to come back no matter what, right? Okay, that's true. But what he does, meanwhile, has a whole lot to do with us how we partner with him in prayer and how we partner with him in how he assigns us and right sends us. So uh, I believe, yeah, there's a message of repentance, which I believe the church right now is desperately needing to be circumcised freshly. I talked about that two weeks ago, right? Cutting away the flesh, you know, carnality of the church and really depending on God and then arising up, awakening up to prayer for starters, right? No, no prayer, no ministry, Period, right? All ministry is fueled by prayer. All advances are fueled by prayer. And not just our own presumptuous prayer, but spirit-inspired prayer, spirit-led prayer, where we get alone with the Holy Spirit and say, what do you want to do and what do you want me to pray? And as he begins to show us what he wants to do and we pray that out, right, that's where, that's where real work gets done. Amen. Real advances are made first in prayer and then, and then, then, then with our feet. Amen. All right, so God said, don't be afraid. I'm with you to deliver you. Go ahead. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. Ooh, this is where it gets really, 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 really good. Because God's saying, here's, here's the deal. Here's how we're going to do this. There's a, you know, I'm going to put my words in your mouth, and that's going to make a difference. Okay, what does that mean? So he's, he's, he's experiencing this, right, uh, spiritually, I'm assuming. I don't, I don't know that God, you know, visibly appeared to him, but how many have had experiences where God is dealing with you, but it's not physical or visible necessarily to the eye, but you, he's still touching you, speaking to you, appearing to you, right? And that's, he absolutely does that. So he says, I put my words in your mouth, boom. And then verse 10 See, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down, to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. Oh, now it gets really, really good. Interesting. So, see, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms and root out and pull down. He's talking about bringing some kingdoms to an end, right? Literally bringing, their, bringing about their, their fall and their end. And he's also talking about to build and to plant, building up other things and, and planting other things. Uh, the riot, you know, and he's talking about Israel's future and he's talking about the surrounding nations. And just got to get the picture here. God says to this young man, see, today I have set you over nations and kingdoms. Put yourself in his shoes for just a minute. What if God said to you, hey, you, today I am set you over nations and kingdoms? And you'd probably be going, um, what? <laughs> what does that look like? What does that mean? What are you talking about? He's a young man, right? He's insecure, right? He's just experiencing his first call from God. And God says, I'm setting you over nations. So is he supposed to become a military leader, a conqueror, and destroy some nations and build up others in the natural? Is that what we're talking about? No, not at all. Not at all. He's talking about most of what he's going to be doing is done in the prayer closet. And most of what he's doing in the prayer closet, nobody will know he's doing it. And nobody will appreciate what he's doing. But he knows because God calls him and God. And how is, he, how, is he, how is he rooting out and pulling down some kingdoms? And how is he building up and planting other kingdoms? It was, in, it was in verse 9. God said, right now I'm putting my word in your mouth. And when you're in your prayer closet and you prophesy and you proclaim and you pray, and even when you go out in public and you prophesy my message and you write my message or whatever, my words in your mouth are what's going to bring kingdoms up and down and bring change. That's how God works. This is amazing because, you know, otherwise I'm sure Jeremiah thinking in the natural will go, how am I going to do this, right? Am I supposed to raise up an army and, you know, no, no, no. This is, this is something that you're going to do uh, in the prayer closet. And think about essentially during Jeremiah's lifetime, most of the people didn't even know who he was. And the people who did know who he was didn't like him. 
I mean, the people in these other nations that he's prophesying over, they don't even know who he is. Some Jewish prophet somewhere, who knows? Who cares, right? They don't even know who he is. The people in Israel that are hearing his message, they don't want to hear it and they don't like him. They're on the wrong track and they're staying on the wrong track, right? So he's essentially rejected um, <laughs> and unwanted and unknown and God speaks to him in a private moment and says, yeah, I'm setting you over nations and kingdoms. I'm putting my word in your mouth. You're going to change nations. You're going to change history. But nobody, but hardly anybody's going to know or care <laughs> that it was you. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> now we all like Prophet Jeremiah, the great Prophet Jeremiah. Yeah, it's like artists are only great after they're dead, right? <laughs> So, <laughs> how does that apply to you and me? Same way. I mean, you don't have to be a biblical prophet writing a book of the Bible. But doesn't God have, a, you know, people for you to influence and people? Yeah, so here's the deal again. God may say, I've set you over your family and your loved ones. Your prayers and your partnership with me is going to make the difference in the future of your family. Amen? Amen? I've, put, I've set you over your community, your church, your community. Am I the leader of the church? No, but in the spirit, I've set you over to pray. I've set you over to prophesy, right? I've set you over, and your prayers and your partnership with God are going to make the difference, right? I've set you over America. Am I the president now? No, I'm calling you into the prayer closet to pray and prophesy over America. And your prayers and your, and your proclamations are going to make a difference. Joining together with all the other people that I'm calling to do the same thing. Amen? Or I'm calling you over this nation or that place, this mission or whatever it may be, this ministry, right? To, you get the idea. God gives prayer assignments. And I, I really believe that he's, you know, he's just speaking to us to revive the idea of intercessory prayer assignments for us. Because it's not something I talk about real often, but it's something I do believe and I do practice. Right? And so, you know... He gives different prayer assignments and different levels. So, you know, somebody maybe get, you know, some of you may get hit like by a ton of bricks with God saying, I'm calling you to pray, you know, and somebody else may be going, yeah, okay, I'll pray a little more. <laughs> you know, I know there's different levels of response and calling to this, and I, I get that, and that's okay. But, but this is what God's telling me to say. He's, he wants to revive a prayer, not because, oh, we're so desperate and all we have now is prayer. It's because God is doing great things and he's going to do great things. And he can do great things, but he wants us to pray. He really, really does. <laughs> Your prayers, again, it's not, oh, God's going to do what God's going to do. Your prayers make the difference. If they don't, let's not ever do this. Let's not waste a minute of our time praying if it really doesn't make any difference. If it's really just a religious exercise we go through, don't do it. But if God says, no, this is really how I work, Right? And, and how, many, how many know you've, you've prayed for something, sometimes you prayed for something and in days or weeks, boom, there's the answer. And you're like, ah, that's awesome. I love prayer. Right? And you prayed for something else for years and it doesn't budge. Anybody? Right? Yeah. Well, it doesn't work. No, it's not that it doesn't work. Some things take years and you keep praying, right? And some things just boom, days or weeks, <laughs> it's done, you know. God says, no, pray. Right? And some things take many people praying together. And God visits people and says, you pray, you pray, you pray, you pray. And here, raise up a prayer meeting here and a prayer meeting there and a prayer movement here. And you pray and we all, you know, pray over big things. Pray until, until it moves, right? Yeah, that's how God works. You know, do, do, my, do my little prayers in part of a bigger movement make a difference? Yes. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Or do my prayers make a difference for my family? Yes. Yes. Yeah, or the people that I work with, or people I take on to pray for. Absolutely, yes. God says, I set you over nations, kingdoms, families, circles of influence, whatever it may be, right? To root out and pull down what the devil's doing and what the devil's done and to build up and plant what God's doing. And it's always one in prayer first, and then you walk it out with your feet. Go ahead. Well, you know what? Actually, let me, let me bring you over to Amos 3.7. just want to kind of speak something else into this. Amos 3, 7, surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. Well, that's an interesting thing. Uh, what does that mean? Again, God could have set this up 
the world system where he just does what he wants to do independently. And then we could all say, God's going to do what God's going to do, right? And we could be passive and we could be un disengaged, right? But that's not how it works. God says, anything I do, uh, I'm going to reveal it to somebody and I'm going to get somebody in agreement with me in prayer. I'm going to get somebody prophesying it, somebody praying it, somebody proclaiming it, right? And big things, he gets a lot of people, right? And it doesn't have to be everybody. God can just use you know, a group of people that respond to his voice, but he does work that way. So in the old covenant, he spoke to his prophets. They're the ones who really knew his voice, right? And he would, anything God was going to do, because what does it say? God does nothing unless he reveals it to a prophet or prophets and gets them into agreement and gets them prophesying it and praying it. That's how God works, right? And that's what he said to Jeremiah. I've put my words in your mouth, right? Good. So, uh, in the New Covenant, what this would look like, in the New Covenant, we're all kind of prophets, in a sense, right? Uh, to some degree, we all are uh, representatives of God. We all have the Holy Spirit living in us, right? And we're all called to pray. So in the New Covenant, it would probably f be phrased more like this. God does nothing unless he reveals it to his covenant people in the church, right? To somebody. He reveals it to somebody and gets them praying, or he reveals it to a bunch of people and gets them praying and gets them prophesying and speaking it out, right? That's how God does his thing. Uh, Amos 3.3 3 also. There we go. Can two walk together unless they are agreed? God has set this up on purpose where he wants to build agreement between heaven and earth. I'm going to do something on earth. I'm going to speak it from heaven, but I'm going to look for somebody on earth to catch it, right? And then begin to pray it out and begin to prophesy it out. That's how that's, God works through that agreement. That's just the way he likes to do it, and he's chosen to do it. And that's a privilege for us. That's a privilege for us. But we don't get to say, well, God's just going to do what God's going to do. We don't get to do that. <laughs> we say, God, what do you want to do? Can I pray? How can I be part of it? Right? And, and you don't have to carry the whole burden. God's got lots of people praying, lots of different things, and lots of different assignments. But what's yours? Right? What's yours? All right. Um, go back to Jeremiah 1. Uh, yeah, let's just read 9 and 10 again. The Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. <laughs> See, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down, to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. And so it's just super important, again, that when, when you respond to God with some prayer time, don't just make it up. Don't, don't be presumptuous, right? Say, God, what, what do you want me to pray? How do you want me to pray? Right? If you're praying for a, some stubborn loved one that you just think, man, that person, they're just, you know, oh, so stubborn or so stubborn, you know, are they ever going to walk with God? Well, ask God, God, what do you want to do in their life? Right? What's your vision for their future? What's the gifting you have for them that they don't even know? Right? And maybe I don't see it either, right? What's the, what's, the, what's the future? What's the purpose? What's the plan for this person, right? And begin to hear God's heart for that person. Then begin to pray it out and begin to prophesy it over them. Amen? Not just going, oh, God, oh, God, get them, get them, get them, get them, save them, and turn them around. God, do something, oh, God. No, find out what God's saying. Find out what his destiny. Find out what his purpose, right? Partner with him. Go ahead, verse uh, 11 and 12 then. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? And I said, I see a branch of an almond tree. This is interesting. Uh, in prophetic ministry, uh, Marcy will teach, I'm sure, uh, at some point there, that there's these kind of three steps right, in, in prophetic ministry. And the first step is revelation. And the second is uh, interpretation. And the third is application. Right? So revelation is this right away. Uh, Jeremiah, what do you see? Oh, I have a vision, I have an image in, in before my eyes right now of an almond branch, right? Hmm. And, and presumably it was like ready to blossom, ready to fruit, you know, and, and with kind of an implied sense of promise to it. But, uh, you know, how many would know if God showed you an almond branch or an almond, a branch of an almond tree, you would go, oh, I totally know what that means. Anybody? No, we don't know, right? <laughs> but God does this. He gives the revelation first, and then we're like, okay, now what? What's the, what does it mean? What's the interpretation? And so God gives that in verse 12. Then the Lord said to me, 
you have seen well, for I am ready to perform my word. That's what the almond branch means. It's ready to fruit. It's ready to blossom, right? And it's, I am ready to perform my word. It's God's encouragement to Jeremiah. When I put my word in your mouth and you pray it out from your prayer closet, when I put my word in your mouth and you prophesy it out, right? I am with you to perform that word. Okay? And some things happen in days and weeks, and some things take years. But do it anyway. Amen. Be obedient anyway, anyway. Right? And he was facing a situation much tougher than we're facing. We're in a new covenant position where we're just advancing the kingdom. He was speaking judgment upon a nation that was in idolatry, <laughs> right? And that had a national covenant with God. That's not our situation, right? And so God is, is faithful to perform his word. And then the, so the revelation and then the interpretation, what does it mean? And then the third thing is the application. What do I do with that now? What do I do with that information? And what he does with that is, uh, yeah, Jeremiah, prophesy and pray as I lead you. Go for it. Don't quit. Don't be discouraged, right? Pretty powerful stuff. I've, I've, uh, I've found personally that this past year uh, I've felt moved by God strongly to pray for America. And I didn't do that much before, to be honest. Before that, before this year, I kind of felt like, yeah, America's a great place to live. I've traveled the world a little bit. America's got it going on. Yay. We got it good here. And we're going to keep having it good here. <laughs> right? And kind of took it for granted. Entitlement again, you know. Like, yeah, we, we have our convenience and we have our drive throughs and we have our, you know, my pillows and we have what, you know, we have, we have all these comforts, you know. And it's just good and life is good here, you know. And, uh, God, you know, began to put on my heart, now pray for this nation. Because there's, there's intense, intense spiritual warfare going on over this nation. Why? Why? I just thought we lived in a good place. I, didn't, I wasn't really too tuned into this, quite honestly, you know. And God began to show me, even more recently, specifically, show me how, you know, he really intended America to be a light to the world. Amen. Now, before, you know, Israel was always called to be a light to the world, right? Israel was the place of God's name, God's presence, God's temple, a witness to the world of, of, that, of God. Uh, and then, you know, uh, Israel came to the point after 70 AD when it was destroyed and again and hasn't been a nation up until 1948, right? And Israel came back together by God's providence. And Israel is intended to be a light to the nations again when they receive Jesus, when they receive their Messiah, they will again be the light to the nations that God intended them to be. But meanwhile, God has, had, has used other nations during that time. And in, in the course of the last couple, two or three centuries, what's it been? You know, it's been America. God has intended America to be not a covenant nation like Israel. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that. But America was founded on Christian faith and Christian principles. And America was intended to be a light to the world. You know, and we've not been a perfect country. We've not been, you know, had perfect justice and perfect righteousness by any stretch. But America has always had a company of people that believe in God, love God, love the, love the gospel, love Jesus. And America has been a missionary and a gospel sending nation. And America has been a place where justice is valued in general, right, by a company of people. And America has been a place that has stood up against tyranny over and over in world wars that would have just probably just, you know, put the whole globe under tyranny, America has stood up numerous times. True, right? In spite of our weaknesses, in spite of our flaws, America has been that. It really has. And America has been a center of religious freedom and a center of sending the gospel and sending missionaries into the world more than any other nation. You know, it was probably Europe before America was raised up, you know, but, but Europe doesn't really do that that much now. It's America, and it has been America. And so... There's intense spiritual warfare going on because the devil wants to snuff out that light of America. And if he can do that, right, he can affect the whole world. You know, and I didn't really see it that way before, you know, but, but now I do. Now I do. And uh, it's not that we're so special. It's just God just chose us to be that. And there's been, you know, and our nation was founded on that. And so, again, if we just take kind of the entitlement attitude, well, we have it good here and, you know, everything's always going to be good here. Oh, no, there's intense spiritual warfare over this nation. We don't pray, we could lose it. Amen? But we do pray, we'll keep God's hand upon us. Amen? I, I really do believe that. Yeah. And 
you know, we can't have that, you know, God's going to do what God's going to do attitude, right? So he has um, great promises for America. I believe that. He has great, he, he, he has not changed his mind. He wants America to be uh, a gospel-sending nation until the end. He wants America to be a friend of Israel until Jesus comes back, if that's possible. Amen? He wants America to be a place that stands against tyranny until the end. I believe that, right? And if, I believe that if we pray, we can have that. Amen? And I believe that if we don't pray, we very likely lose that. You know, would Jesus still come back and would everything still end up the same in the book of Revelation? Yeah, I guess so, but I'd rather have our part be, right, <laughs> right. a place of, of, his, of his glory and his presence rather than a place where the light got snuffed out. And that's why the devil has tried so hard to infiltrate all of our institutions, our colleges, our universities, our schools, our scientific uh, institutions, our, our government, of course, our finances and economics, and, and our, um, what else, our entertainment industry, our media industry, our family structures. The devil has tried to eat at every single thing in our nation to turn it against God's way and to get demonic strongholds in to snuff out this nation. Amen? And, yeah, and, and, you know, and it's been kind of the frog in the kettle thing. You know, I don't know if you know that story, but basically, you know, kind of by degrees, but it's speeding up fast, isn't it? Speeding up fast. The warfare is speeding up fast. And that's why this year I woke up probably more than ever before and was like, wow, we got, let's pray for this country. Amen. Let's pray for this country. Let's not just assume things are good and things will always be good um, because there's too much spiritual warfare that doesn't quit. So, and that being said, you know, and I know that the election is still... I talked about that a few weeks back. Uh, I don't believe it's decided yet, <laughs> right? Yeah, and if there's, if there's fraud to be uncovered, uh, let's pray that it's uncovered, and let's pray that, you know, truth is, truth is told, and, uh, and we'll see where that goes. I, I believe God has plans, right? I can live with it either way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the early church was under the Roman Empire, you know, and it wasn't fun for them. Uh, I can live with it either way, but if, but if there's fraud to be uncovered here, uh, let's pray and let's let God do his thing. Amen? <laughs> All right. So let's close. Was this helpful to anybody? The whole thing? All right. I know I kind of turned direction at the end there, but this is where I want to bring it to an application. So let's, uh, let's get communion ready, if you have that handy. If you didn't get that, you could raise your hand and somebody will bring it to you, or you could run, grab it off the table. And I have a communion verse, Hebrews 10, 19, and 20. It says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh. To really unpack that would take some time, but the short version of that is by the torn body of Jesus on the cross and by the shed blood of Jesus on the cross we now have bold entrance into the throne room of God we now have bold access to the holy of holies God's throne and presence and that access is for a purpose and a reason. We talked about it last week. We can go in and receive encounters with God and assignments and directives and giftings. But another reason for that access is to go in and pray. To enter into the throne room and pray as an intercessor. And so let's take that access right now. If you have the, the bread and the cup, thank you, Jesus, that you made the way for us. You opened the way into the throne room through your torn body on the cross, through your shed blood, redeeming us from sin and death. Jesus, we take this access. Let's eat and drink together. And would you just uh, join me in prayer for 
I'll be brief, but can we just pray a prayer together for America, please? Right now especially is an important time to do this. So, Father God, we thank you that America has been a place that's been so blessed and so prospered so clearly by the hand of God, by the favor and prosperity of God. Oh, it's so, it's so evident, God. And we, we give you thanks for that. We acknowledge that that's you, God. We acknowledge that you did that. And we thank you for it. We live in a very, very blessed place. And we want it to stay that way. And God, we acknowledge also that you, from the beginning, put your hand on this nation to be a light to the world. To be a gospel-sending, missionary-sending nation. To be a, a place that stands up for freedom against tyranny. To be a place that speaks out for justice and human rights. And we haven't gotten it all right, God. We've done some, as a nation, we've done some things really wrong. But God, it's still been a place in the world that has been a light to places even darker. It's still been a place where the name of Jesus is honored and there's freedom to worship. It's still been a place where there's a company of men and women who love God and where the presence of God is welcome and honored where the work of God has a home base to go forth into the world. So God, we acknowledge that, that that was your purpose. And that's why the devil wants to destroy this nation and snuff that out. But God, we pray in Jesus' name, have mercy and forgive the sins of America, God. But we pray in your grace, God, do not remove your hand, God. We pray, keep your hand upon America. God, and bring us forward into your calling and your purpose. We know that not everybody is in agreement. Not everybody wants to come along for that ride, God. But there's, there's a, a company of, of us, of your covenant people in this nation, God, that say, God, we want you. We want your plan and your purpose for America. And we are your covenant people. And our prayers matter. And our proclamations matter, God. And America will be a friend of, to Israel until Jesus comes. We say that America will be a gospel-sending and missionary-sending nation until Jesus comes. We say that America will, be, will stand for freedom against tyranny until Jesus comes. We say that America will continue to discover what justice means and, and improve ourselves as a nation, God. And that America will be a place where unborn babies are valued and protected, God the same as a born baby is. God, we pray America will be a place where people of uh, different perceived races and backgrounds, God, will mutually value and value each other and respect each other. And that you'll raise up voices in that direction, God. God, we pray that your hand will be on this nation for good to protect our freedom, God. And we pray that you will rip out of our nation, God, the Antichrist spirit, the Jezebel spirit that's trying to attack. God, we pray that you would expose it and rip it out. And if there's any fraud or corruption in the dark places, God, that we pray that you would expose that and bring truth, God. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, God. We pray that you would tear out of our colleges and universities and our entertainment and our media and our science institutions and in our business and our government and our family institutions, God, that you would tear out antichrist spirit, antichrist strongholds, God, and that you would raise up men and women into the places of influence in all of those areas that would love God and speak out God's truth and bring and advance the kingdom of God in America, Lord. We pray that this would be a place of your presence and a home base for your working in the world, God. God, by your grace and by your mercy, let that continue. We cry out to you, God. Our eyes are on you. We thank you, Lord, that you are with us. That you are with us, God. Thank you, God, for this nation. What an amazing example of your goodness. Hallelujah. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody agrees, says... Amen, amen, amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here today. Hope you had a happy Thanksgiving.